Hello and welcome to News Click. You are watching Present, Past and the Future. It is very difficult these days in India to find leading public figures debating and discussing issues, their agreements and disagreements with any amount of civility. Abusive quality of political discourse during elections is the new constant. This erodes deliberation on vital issues confronting the nation. It also results in policy formulation being the brainwave of a single leader or his chosen confidant. There, however, is a template of how friends can also be intellectual adversaries, yet work towards making the nation more vibrant, its people stronger and in control of their destiny. I am talking about the three and a half decade long interaction and correspondence between Mahatma Gandhi and Gurudev Ravindranath Tagore. Their intellectual exchange began in 1914 and 15 when Mahatma Gandhi, along with the students of his Phoenix school in South Africa, visited Shantiniketan. At that time, Tagore's school was not yet 15 years old. He himself was just 53 and had just received the Nobel Prize just a year ago. Gandhi, eight years younger, was yet to attain national stature in India, although his work in South Africa was widely known. There were many striking contrasts between these two personalities. For one, Gandhi was the archetypal ascetic in loin cloth, while Tagore was the divinely handsome poet in his flowing robes. One's primary concern was with the creation of a moral utopia, while the other was the high priest of life's many splendors. Yet, they found common chord and struck a friendship. It lasted till 1941 when Tagore died. Four years later, Gandhi visited Shantiniketan one last time in his own life. He said at the conclusion of the visit, I started with a disposition to detect a conflict between Gurudev and myself, but ended with a glorious discovery that there was none. As early as February 1915, Tagore began referring to Gandhi as Mahatma and Gandhi readily adopted the form of address addressing Tagore as Gurudev. Despite disagreements, the two never doubted greatness in the other. From matters related to con the country's freedom to boycotting foreign, foreign cloth, their letters had it all. The correspondence between Tagore and Gandhi the two greatest Indians in the first half of the 20th century contains much of the moral and political dilemma of the country and its people. The matters they debated often related to nationalism, a theme which troubled Tagore greatly as he saw the rise of chauvinistic nationalism in many parts of the world. These debates hold lesson for much of what is happening in India now. Tagore founded, in a way, the Award Wapsi Gang by renouncing his knighthood. Because of the enormity of the measures taken by the government, Tagore said, it was time when badges of honour make our shame glaring. To discuss this remarkable intellectual exchange between Gandhi and Tagore, I am joined by the preeminent scholar of modern Indian history, Mridula Mukherjee. Among other facts, she will also enable us to understand the high philosophical plane on which they elevated political debate and how the two were constantly willing to learn from one another. Their greatness was in being small before the other, despite being towering personalities. Welcome, Ridula. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank Let you. me begin with what I was saying. You know, this constant contrast between the present and the past. You know, what we find is that at the time of Gandhi and Tagore, the beautiful relationship which they had over three and a half decades, possibly one of the most intellectually, you know, vibrant partnership that one can say, there was never any game of one-upmanship. 
Now, what do you think were the most dominant features or the characteristics of their interaction? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, I would say that the relationship was based on a great amount of mutual respect, respect. and admiration. Right. In fact, if you see the language they use for each other, it is always in superlatives, right. you know. Uh, for example, uh, Ravindranath Tagore, of course, he was a poet and he wrote beautifully. So I could uh, begin by just quoting a line from sure. how he described uh, Mahatma Gandhi and what Gandhi meant, right. his coming to India and the national movement meant. Mm. And this is when he's criticizing him. Right. In an essay in which he's criticizing him, he says, uh, at this juncture, Mahatma Gandhi came and stood at the cottage door of the destitute millions, right. clad as one of themselves and talking to them in their own language. language. Here was the truth at last, not a mere quotation out of a book. Right. So the name of Mahatma which was given to him is his true name. Who else has felt so many men of India to be of his own flesh and blood? And as soon as true love stood at India's door, mm. it flew open. All hesitation and holding back vanished. So he describes the advent of Gandhi on the Indian political scene that how before that uh, there were great leaders, but they could not touch the people in that kind of way. So he's trying to explain what it was about Gandhiji. Yeah. Just tell me, you know, that uh, in 1914-15, when Gandhi's greatness is not yet known, what was it that drew Tagore to Gandhi? What was it that made him start calling him uh, Mahatma? Well, I think, you know, we often make this mistake hmm. of thinking that before Gandhi becomes uh, active on the Indian scene, we tend to uh, ignore South people that people in India didn't know him. Fact of the matter is, he'd been working for 20 years in South right. Africa. He used to come every year to India and he attended most sessions of the Indian National Congress. Right. And he toured India and he brought the troubles of the Indians of South Africa, of South Africa to the people of India through mm. these various uh, fora. Mm. In fact, by about the middle of the first decade of the 20th century, when the movement there had matured and actually taken the form of Satyagraha, mm. and then it became a big mass movement, mm. I think by then, political India certainly knew uh, Gandhi. Hmm. Secondly, what Gandhiji was doing in South Africa was extraordinary, hmm. even when you compared it with the political movement in India. For example, Satyagraha, which started in 1906, hmm. already had civil disobedience, right. uh, not just passive resistance, but at that time what they called it, but civil disobedience as a form hmm. of struggle where people burnt their certificates and rejected what the government of the day was asking them to do. Hmm. A little while later, he took thousands of those indentured labor who were there, very poor, very destitute. He mobilized them into a strike and he marched 2,000 of them across a border and then they were all imprisoned and spent mm. uh, more than a year in jail. So that kind of politics, which went much beyond the elites, mm. much beyond the middle classes, much beyond the even the lower middle classes, actually went to the poorest sections because you couldn't be poorer than an indentured laborer. But Gandhi didn't come to India and immediately start you know, trying to replicate what he had been doing. Obviously, it would South take Africa, time, time for so the for for his politics to he, become mainstream politics. Yet somebody like Tagore still understood thought, understood that he had the qualities of yeah. Mahatma that it was possibly just a matter of time before he would begin replicating uh, what he had been doing. So I think that already what he had done, this is what I was trying to say, mm. that in a way, uh, in South Africa, Gandhi had already shown the future of Indian politics. And I think percep perceptive minds in India could see that. It is not for nothing that Gokhale right. 
right. was such an admirer of Gandhi. He went all the way to South Africa right. to Gandhi help him actually. Gandhi himself completely and the disciple Gandhi of Gandhi of course there. thought himself, of thought that he was his political guru. But it was very mutual, yeah. Yeah. that kind of uh, admiration. You know, when Gandhiji first reached India and when we all know he went on this uh, tour in a third class railway compartment right. all over Very India. Very pointedly huh? captured in, in Richard it, Attenborough's film. That's right. Yeah. So he went to Haridwar, which was one of mm. the first places he went to. And they were themselves amazed because crowds collected to see him. So his name had become a household name before Champaran. Okay. I think this is what is very significant. How does otherwise Rajkumar Shukla a peasant of Champaran start following him around the country to say, hmm. Mahatma Ji, please come to Champaran and solve our problems of the uh, tenants of uh, Champaran. Because he already had that image as a mascot of the poor. Hmm. So I think that is very important. You know, Mridula, when we read about the exchange between Gandhi and Tagore, it comes across very clearly that there were large areas of disagreements also. Yes, yes. Yet, you know, Despite, and all that, this is in the public domain, you know, uh, Tagore, uh, you know, had disagreements with the way in which Satyagraha was conducted. He was not very certain about the strategies used during mm. the non-cooperation movement. All those are part of his articles, the letters, the communications which are there. Yet there was, you know, the commonality at the core of their worldview. In fact, let me read out what Jawala Nehru had said, you know, that he said, that no two persons could probably differ as much as Gandhi and Tagore. Both men with so much in common and drawing inspiration from the same wealths of wisdom and thought and culture should differ from each other so greatly. Now Nehru said mm. this because of what I quote again, the richness of India's age-old cultural genius which can throw up in the same generation mm. two such master types typical of her in every way, yet representing uh, representing different aspects of her many-sided personality. Mm. Now, you know, we mm. need to understand that, yes, but what was it that really uh, brought Tagore and Gandhi together? You know, it, mm. it, you know I'm asking mm. this question because today everybody swears by Indianness mm. and what they call, you know, Indian nationhood. Everybody has their own definitions of it. But Gandhi and Tagore had something different going, what really brought them together? What was it? Well, at a very abstract level, I would say what yeah. brought them together was a relentless pursuit of the truth. You know, by that I mean pursuing something that is authentic in your life mm. and pursuing it to the end regardless. Mm. The honesty, the conviction that both of them had mm. in what they were doing, Tagore, when after this, after his Swadeshi uh, phase, where he was a very active political person. Mm. But then he had certain disagreements with the Swadeshi movement itself, right, right in 1905. Yeah. In fact, much of his disagreement with Gandhi actually is a product of that experience. And he brings that experience exactly into... What exactly were these You see, he, for example, uh, he uh, he, uh, he did he was not happy with the boycott uh, of uh, foreign cloth, right. and he expressed it right then. He, he felt in fact said that what will Indians wear? That was one, and he felt that it was kind of coercive on the poor. Okay. So you know there were dis he was also uh, a little disillusioned with the some of the radical groups uh, within the Congress. Was this also somehow linked time? with the with the? Call, you know, Tego's opposition to the call to boycott government schools during the non cooperation movement. That's right, that's right. And they had had that kind of trend in the Swadeshi movement, which he had uh, okay. objected to. So mm. he did not think that without an alternative, you, you should ask children to mm. come out to of school. To stay out of school. school. So one was concrete kind of uh, differences mm. that, that they might have. But I think uh, to go back to what would be the commonalities, mm. one, I mean, just, just look at uh, for example, uh, their similarity when it comes to the issue of education. Right. I mean, after all, Tagore's major 
uh, energy was spent in setting up Shanti Niketan, yes. right? Which, Gandhi also did which was his well. alternative to the not just the British governmental uh, type of education, but any formal type of education yes. which an industrial which society outside, yes. uh, has brought about. And so was Gandhi deeply opposed to it. He had his mm. own variations, uh, the Nai Talim, for example. Mm. It was not identical. Also did something yeah. Similar in, in uh, Sabarmati Ashram in a very limited That's way. That's right. So one was, I think, you know, there was that very common concern and a discomfort with some of the rigidities and uh, standardization that come out of a modern uh, state system. Right. I think somewhere they were both suspicious of the modern state. In some ways, anarchists. Gandhi was more, uh, you know, back into the idyllic rural well, world, you, but Tagore was yeah. also you know, a great I, admirer you know, of rural. In practice, I don't think there was that much difference, you know. Where Gandhi did a critique, he did it from a vantage point. Hmm. But when it comes to actual uh, practices, Gandhi was not really wanting to go back to ancient India. He knew you couldn't. Hmm. That was not. It was his suspicion of the big daddy modern state. Hmm. Know where he felt that autonomy and villages uh, being able to produce on their own, regions being able to be sell. It's it's today we say I've got my produce from the nearest <laughs> farmer. You know, mm -hmm. if somewhere some of the things are now becoming very popular by way of the environmental movement, but some of Gandhi's ideas today are very contemporary. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, but apart from that, I think. I also think that though their views at a point, there's a huge argument on what is the meaning of nationalism mm. and in the context of what is happening at that time, I think basically they were both ardent Indian nationalists. Mm. I also believe that Gandhi was as much of an internationalist as Tagore was. Okay. The debate which takes place between them, mm. which starts off with uh, Gurudev hmm. uh, making his points about after his experience uh, in Japan, his visit to Japan, where he can see the early rise of the of militaristic type state. of nationalism, what is happening in Europe, the emergence of uh, fascism, what happened in the First World War, the jingoistic kind of hmm. nationalism. You can see that he's getting uncomfortable with that kind of nationalism, but mm. Tagore sort of generalizes it. Mm -hmm. And it, in him, it gets expressed as a suspicion of nationalism. Mm -hmm. And Gandhi then defends himself and Indian nationalism. And in fact, the words he uses are very contemporary. He says, ours is not an exclusionary nationalism. Mm -hmm. It is an inclusive one. It, in fact, it is based on the welfare of the poor. Mm. And then he also makes that famous statement of his in a letter to Tagore, where he says, I want the winds of the whole world uh, to blow through my house. Okay. I want all my windows to be open. So but, that is the kind but, of internationalism. But I don't want about. to be swept off my feet. Right. So he says so very clearly. Embrace, yes, to pick and what to, is good for, for us but yeah. not be guided by them and try it's, to prove us ourselves. In, in fact, let me just uh, quote uh, Gandhi on this when he's yeah. countering uh, Tagore's criticism. Yes, he yes, says yes. That, uh, that he was not taking an isolated view of the country. He says, our non-cooperation is neither with the English nor with the West. Mm -hmm. Our non-cooperation is with the system that the English have established because Indian nationalism is not exclusive, it is humanitarianism. Okay. So he's taking it to the whole of human uh, right. society. And he, he then says, patriotism for me is the same as humanity. See the two. So international fact, and humanity fact, is the, Both of them make a constant ex distinction ex between patriotism and nationalism. This is something which gets blurred all the time in See, contemporary India. Yeah, but you know, sometimes the words may be different, but mm. the meaning which uh, Gandhi is putting into the term nationalism or Indian nationalism put mm. into the term nationalism is not different. Okay. You know, uh, again, he says it is the narrowness, selfishness and exclusiveness, which is the bane of modern nations, which is evil. And through the realization of freedom of India, I hope to realize and carry on the mission of brotherhood of men. 
But what the distinction I think which Gandhi emphasizes, mm. he says you cannot help your neighbor if you can't stand on your own feet. Right. So there is no internationalism without first standing on your own feet strong and making yourself stronger. Ex ex that's and if right. If you have to make yourself stronger, yes. you have to take care of the poorest exactly. of the people. Yeah, yes, yeah, that is very important. You know, so I think here, but but I think what you first started out with, you know, the quality of the debate is so uplifting. It is so not just enlightening, you know, but it makes you feel as if you are in the presence of something which is so you know, fantastic. Reading the letters, you you actually get transported <laughs> back in the. 1920s, 30s, you know, that entire period. Uh, ab, you ab, that transport. actually, this this kind of debate is what a democracy you know, there, is there, really there, about. Yeah, there's something, you know, you know, you're talking about what democracy is all about, you know, and debate, you know. Uh, whenever there is such an exchange between people, to what extent between these two, was there a, you know, how much did they change their respective positions? How much did they... Uh, explain their position on which the other disagreed and how much of it was actually a bit of both. They would have both changed their positions listening to the other because both were very committed Democrats. So it's not that they decided this is the truth with which I am sitting. I am not going to alter my position. Oh, absolutely. I think the first principle of such a debate and discussion, if it is to be meaningful at all, has to be openness on both sides. Be willing to change yeah. one's position. Yeah. First of and all, be willing to understand it. what have to be open to understand what the other person is trying to say mm. and then try and come to terms with it. Mm. And also then be concerned enough about the other person's opinion to actually explain your position. In fact, because mm. I think because Tagore objected, for example, so strongly to the Charkha mm. and what he thought was Gandhi's exclusive emphasis on the Charkha, the way Gandhi clarifies his position on the Charkha, mm. which you probably would not have got otherwise, because here he is dealing with somebody who is an outstanding mm. person, mm. intellectual, uh, man, poet, I mean, you know, uh, he's he's not talking to any anybody, yes. just any, any person down the street. So here he's also then constrained to, in a sense, rise to that. And, and be able explain to explain and, to somebody yes, with the intellectual caliber of Tagore. Th that's right. And there's also some very nice uh, barbs at each other, if you if you read it yes. carefully, with, in good humor, but they're sharp. So yes. it's not as if it's a very woolly-woolly kind of uh, debate. It's a sharp debate where no uh, nothing is spared, but it's done in a polite language with respect for each other, but no concession at the intellectual level. Hmm. I think that is what is the beauty of uh, the, the debate as I see it. And in fact, of a different kind, as you know, uh, is uh, Nehru's critique of Gandhi. You know, yeah. in the autobiography, almost half the book is actually an argument with Gandhi. Yes. So this Disagling. quality of the freedom struggle that they... Being together yet also having different opinion, you know, that is something which is very important to the freedom struggle. and. Mutual respect despite of disagreement. But that is the only way that you can actually build, uh, what shall I say, a, a country or a movement and a future with a vision which is expansive, which actually is meaningful. Because no one person can have uh, all, the qualities. all the qualities and the answer and a, and, and a, a sort of secret road right. uh, to the truth. And the only way you can do this is through sharp arguments, but with respect and then build a consensus. Mm. I think the word consensus is extremely important. Consensus does not mean a unhealthy compromise. No. Consensus means actually accommodating many positions. Genuinely accommodating them, understanding their value, thinking maybe this person really has a point and my position will benefit from that. This is something which we are actually okay. seeing, you know, in, uh, you, know, you know, being totally short a characteristics which is not there in today's political leaders. I know. In, <laughs> in fact, adversary, uh, you use the word adversary, I would say adversary or, you know, whatever, debating partner if you like, mm -hmm. but not enemy. 
Yes. They were not enemies. They were all part Definitely of the same uh, agenda. They had a common goal, a common objective. Ab absolutely. You know, you, no? some time ago you were talking about how Gandhi and Tagore both said, you know, that the, the, of opening up the hearts, you know, and the mm. windows to the entire world. Now, if while reading we find, you know, that even people like Roma Rola, you know, mm. who, who did have a very vibrant relationship with Tagore specifically, you know, he described the debate as, you know, between the two as a very noble one. And he said, you know, that it embraces the whole earth mm. and that the whole humanity joins this August dispute. Mm. Which means that, mm. you know, the intellectual giants of mm. that time Absolutely. were very much enamored by the kind of debate and discussion and being able to understand through their dialogue, being able to understand what was there in the minds of these two intellectual giants. Why is it that in today's world, you know, when we talk about Gandhi, you know, the entire country has been talking about mm. 150 years mm. of Gandhi, but we have not heard about this relationship much. Why is it got <laughs> forgotten and to what extent is it necessary for us to resurrect this debate and this uh, dialogue which continued f from 1914 to 1941? Well, I think as with a lot else, uh, we really need to resurrect it. I couldn't agree with you more, but I think uh, the fact that we have lost a lot of it and we don't know a lot of this legacy uh, is also the reason why we have been going wrong and we have been straying from that true path which was set for us mm -hmm. uh, by the freedom struggle. And I mean that not in terms of just blindly copying or, you know, uh, in a routine kind of way, just going about doing things which were mm. set by our predecessors. But in terms of actually debating, discussing and reliving those values, mm. which are so crucial. I mean, for example, uh, what is associated with this kind of uh, debate and discussion? Right. I think uh, values uh, such as the value, what is the meaning of democracy? Hmm. And at the heart of it lies this. How are human beings going to govern themselves? When we hmm. say these were at a high philosophical plane, right. it's because they are raising very fundamental questions right. about civilization. Challenging about, their own perception. Exactly. So I think that forgetting that means that we have just got sucked into the routine of this thing. And in the meantime, uh, malevolent forces around us are walking away with our institutions, True. walking away with what we have taken for granted. I think we became sanguine. We thought that because we have been a functioning democracy with all its ills and faults for we so many we years. We continue to stumble along uh, without, some, exactly. without, without actually. Yeah. That's right. We'll go through highs and lows, but we never anticipated or prepared for a situation where you could be completely derailed. And I think world, not just in India, but I think it's important to see this is so relevant because in so many parts of the world this is happening. Right. People have let their guards down and others have come in and stolen the baby. Well, I hope that this little con <laughs> short conversation between the two of us would possibly, uh, you know, at least, you know, our viewers, who, whoever are watching us, would possibly go back and actually pick up this, uh, the dialogue between Tagore and uh, Gandhi for three and a half decades. It's really a pleasure to you speak to Mridula all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. For Tagore, the national movement was also one of emancipation of man from national egoism, which we were talking about. It is a tall order in today's India at a time of competitive populism. In Gandhi's 150th birth anniversary year, it is appropriate to recall what Tagore said about the man who the British once dismissed as a half-naked fakir. Although frail in body and devoid of military resources, Gandhi called up immense power of the meek. That has been lying waiting in the heart of the destitute and insulted humanity of India. We require the spirit of Gandhi or a reincarnate to raise the history of man from the muddy level of physical conflict to the higher moral attitude. Do imbibe this lasting friendship, which is also a mutual challenge. Thank you.